<laughs> I like everybody just take a look at this uh, this illustration that I'm using here. This is one that was done by Father Dalloway uh, back, uh, my guess would be about probably 1940, 1950 maybe. And I was uh, very surprised one day a very long time ago to receive that as a gift from him. And Dowling was a uh, professor at the uh, University of Detroit, the Society of, of, uh, of Jesus. He was a Jesuit in every, in every regard. And he really was one of the dean of Great Lakes historians way back. Uh, one of the fellows who, if you will, started the movement and started the recognition of the Great Lakes as a source of maritime history. So like a lot of things, there's more than just what you see. There's a really great backstory to it. Uh, this is a terrific story. It's one that is rarely told and, and even less understood. Um, it, it is very rich in detail. I'm not going to have the opportunity to go into a lot of that today, obviously, in 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm only scratching the surface on it, but uh, I hope I will be able to give enough of that detail so you'll, you'll really understand what happened, how it happened, and what the, the solution and the answer may be today. Sources I'm using uh, or have used, uh, books, articles, newspaper, all the typical secondary material, but also great material from National Archives, not only from the Coast Guard, but from the Navy. Uh, Navy at the time was controlling the Coast Guard as it was World War I. Also French Naval Investigations, the French Naval Archives, uh, various French Navy complementary material to include all of the death certificates from the crew, which were extraordinarily illuminating as to what may have happened. General situation, though, we talk about the two minesweepers. What's a minesweeper? It's a small naval warship designed to engage in minesweeping using various mechanisms to counter the threat posed by naval mines, thus clearing waterways for safe shipping. Very simple mission statement, very complicated to try and do that. The technology that they were using during World War I was essentially a variation of this theme that I'm showing you a small vessel towing a wire rope or wire uh, cable rather, often referred to as a sweep. Uh, that kept parallel with the bottom by a couple of barn doors or depressors. And then the intention being that this sweep would go across the bottom of the waterway. It would catch any floating naval mines in it and either cause them to slide to the end of the sweep where there would be a special cutter that would cut the cable and send them to the surface or in fact, in some cases, the sweep itself was uh, serrated and would do the cutting job. And then once the mine was on the surface, it would be sunk by either naval gunfire or a uh, marksman using small arms. Um, this was the mine that we we're discussing. It's basically a German contact mine. You can see the horns coming out of it on the right-hand side of the picture. In fact, I can find the little pointer here and make that a little bit easier. The, horns on the right hand side of the picture. Mine sweeping, of course, is still done today. French Navy is involved in a fair amount of it. Uh, this particular vessel is an example of some of the small mine sweepers the French are employing. Not really too dissimilar than what the original mine sweepers in 1918 were like. Okay, so why did they need mine sweepers? They needed them because the British Navy and the French Navy, the Allied forces during World War I, were planting hundreds of thousands of mines across particularly the North Sea, but also in the Mediterranean. And the purpose behind those was to prevent German U-boats, submarines, from escaping from Germany and using those waterways to gain entrance to the ocean where they would then be able to sink Allied warships or uh, uh, transport vessels. Um, the Germans were doing the same thing. Here's an example of the vessel sunk by German mines during World War I and their rough locations. So again, a very effective weapon. Um, you could deploy these things from larger vessels too. In this case, you see the back end of a cruiser that's dropping the mines as it's going along. But look at that bullet point there, 421 vessels manned by 600 officers and 15,000 uh, sailors would be needed to clear up all of these mines following World War I. And they proved not to be very effective in stopping German submarines. Uh, you needed to use about 31,000 before you had one submarine kill. So only six subs were actually sunk by mines during the First World War. Uh, Germans, of course, would not use surface vessels, but usually use uh, specially constructed submarines to do the same thing. 
But by the end of the war, and using the Royal Navy as the example of this, uh, they had 110 minesweepers in the Navy as naval vessels, and they had taken uh, 616 from trade. In other words, they had taken commercial fishing trawlers, quickly outfitted them as minesweepers, and then used those. Uh, about a 30% attrition rate during the war, so extremely hazardous duty. This makes a good point. It makes the point that a commercial fishing trawler is essentially the same vessel as a minesweeper would have been in 1918. Construction is the same, operation is the same, they're almost the same craft, and in fact, as you investigate deeper into the two missing minesweepers on Lake Superior, and you get to the original French documents, you see they're usually referred to as patrol craft, then mine sweepers, but it is essentially, again, the same vessel. So how were we building them on, on Lake Superior of all places? How did that happen? Well, all of the shipyards in Europe were absolutely crowded with wartime construction, as you might imagine, and the need to build smaller vessels was certainly pushed to the bottom of the pile. So the French naval mission, to North America, which was working primarily with the US and Canada to find places where they could build vessels for the French Navy in the Great Lakes, as well as Atlantic and Pacific seaboards, had the mission of get these dozen minesweepers built. That's what we need. We need a dozen of them, go find a place to build them. And while you're at it, find a design too. So they would work with the US Shipping Board, uh, which had the decision as to what shipyards would build them. Uh, they would eventually end up at uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, at Manitowoc uh, Marine Corporation, or Manitowoc Shipbuilding, who had just completed four very similar minesweepers, uh, except they were identified at that point as fishing trawlers for various states in the United States. So they had the plans of what they needed. They knew how to do it. They had the technology. They had the experience. They just didn't have the yard space to build them. But they were able to find a company in Fort William, Ontario, which is today's Thunder Bay, uh, that had a, a manufactory for rail cars. And they thought was, well, can we convert that to build these very simple minesweepers? The answer was, of course they could. And that would be the plan that the company selected would be Canadian Car and Foundry. Now understand, they decided in late, uh, in 1917 to build them, they had to have them constructed and off the lakes by winter of 1918. So give us a closure about November 30, that was the absolute drop dead date, they had to be completed and off the lakes. So they had extreme pressure to have that mission completed. Especially considering that Canadian Car and Foundry, while they had a small factory in Fort William that was building rail cars and buses, they did not have a shipyard. So they had to build the facility to build the minesweepers in, as well as handle all of the outfitting, et cetera, et cetera. However, it's become myth that Canadian Car and Foundry was just this quickly built company, a bunch of guys trying to make wartime money very quickly. Uh, obviously no capability of building ships, et cetera, et cetera. The reality was that Canadian Car and Foundry company uh, was a major Canadian corporation at the time. They owned the Montreal Steelworks, which was the largest producer of steel castings in Canada. Uh, they had a, a rolling mill in Ontario, again, massive facilities. They were building buses, rail cars around the world. And uh, they were a, a very uh, well thought of concern. Uh, by 1920s, they're selling their product uh, to, literally around the world, South Africa, Brazil, the U.S. World War II would still see them building cutting-edge aircraft, particularly the Hawker Hurricane, the Helldivers. Post-war, they would morph into Bombier transportation, and today are building jetliners uh, that are seeing worldwide service. So again, a very reputable company, and that myth should be dispelled. On the Great Lakes at the time, we were building a lot of uh, naval craft for the war effort. Uh, Ford, for example, had uh, 60 uh, 200-foot patrol craft that they were building. Uh, Sub-chasers were being built, small freighters. The Port Arthur Shipbuilding Company just across the harbor from Fort William was in the middle of building 18 minesweepers for the British Navy and had bid to build submarines. Now, the submarine is the most critically 
uh, built and difficult build in any naval. So for them to be able to do it really speaks well to the technology that was available on the lakes to build naval vessels. So we've got the Canadian Corn Foundry agreeing, agreeing to build it. They've got uh, some space now in Fort William. They're going to build a shipyard. And with the contract, they have to be completed by the end of 1918 and the vessels delivered to uh, either Montreal or further on into Boston. Problem being the shipyard itself is 500 yards away from the Cam River, which would be the site where the ships would be launched into. Uh, they would be wrestling with trying to find adequate manpower. Canada was not at that time a industrial country. It was largely agrarian. Most of the farming activity, in fact, was being done with horse and wagon. It was not industrialized, so they did not have a very deep reservoir of, of, a, of a qualified, skilled workforce in terms of naval architects, draft, draftsmen, engineers, the people that you needed to really run the yard. So those folks were brought in from everywhere, including the United States, from France, from Britain. It was a, I don't want to use the word polyglot, but I, I will say that it was very much of a, of a multi-ethnic uh, workforce that was in place. So they would have a dozen of these they needed to build, all named after French naval victories. Um, and all, again, had to be completed within six months, starting the process in June of 1918. That was when the first three would be built. Here's a building chart of what they had designed, six of them at a time in the building yard. And when the six were done, the next six would step up and be completed. Each one of those little indents on the left-hand side of the screen shows a particular activity. Uh, whether it's framing, launching, adding engines and boilers. So you literally had a critical path network through it developed to see that the work was done on time. This is what the product would look like. Uh, very typical fishing trawler, very typical naval minesweeper too. Uh, two key things about it, speed about 12 knots, steel built of course, and all the engines came from the United States. They were unable to procure them on the open market in Canada. So nine of them were out of uh, Milwaukee as Norbergs and another three at Marine Irons out of Chicago. Uh, they were considered to be uh, very fine products. Here's an example of rather a picture of what the shipyard itself looked like. They were building in the summer only, so they didn't need to have a winterized building, literally building outside with a rain shelter. The facility today would have occupied this portion of the Bombardier plant, which is still there. Uh, this was uh, this is new construction. The old shipyard is long gone, but here's that 500 yard run they would have to make before they hit the water. And they did that in a very unique way. One of the minesweepers up with the framing being put into place. These were being built as commercial vessels. They were not being built as naval craft. So the extra staunchness that you would put into a warship, it was not being built into these 12 minesweepers. The French had a very clear understanding that the war would end fairly soon. And uh, they wanted to be able to put these ships on the market once they finished their naval duty. Uh, that would allow them then to be reused in the civilian world as fishing trawlers or other vessels. Uh, here's one again in the building stages uh, getting her plated up and not too far from being ready to launch. And the way they would launch them is to slide them under or slide them onto this, this railway configuration, this cradle, and then using a series of pulleys and a small yard engine, be able to drag her down the launching way and finally drop her into the water the same way you would almost launch your boat today at a, at a commercial uh, launch way. Each of the vessels was uh, was launched with proper uh, attention paid to uh, tradition. In this case, the uh, the gal you can see there in white has a configuration that will allow her to name the vessel and christen her with the the bottle of alcohol. Uh, the local dignitaries would show up. You can see two of the French naval officers there. Uh, one of the challenges in, in doing the research is trying to identify who these people are. Uh, and so far that has been a very frustrating experience. Um, and here's another set of, uh, of launching a second vessel. I always enjoy 
kind of glancing at the gal on the left-hand side with a little foo-foo dog uh, that was indeed taken to the launchway. I think the fella on your immediate left and sit sitting uh, was one of the radio operators on the vessel, and this would have been the palestro. Again, just a shot of one of them going into the, the launch basin. Later, the, uh, the lock would be opened up. She'd be, be taken out into the lake, and you can see some of the cranes that would have been used in the fitting out process. So as they completed batches of three, they bundled them up, uh, put somebody in charge, and sent them on off to Montreal, where they would be reconfigured and sent on to Boston. The intention was to assemble the 12 of them in Boston and then take them over at once to France. Uh, that never would happen. Uh, where the war would end completely, uh, peace would be signed before they would uh, be disposed of uh, to the civilian market. So here's the last three of them to be built and uh, to be taken over on, on out of Lake Superior, Increman, Cirrusols, and Sebastopol. They were placed under the command of a Lieutenant Leclerc, uh, 38 French sailors in each one, a very basic configuration of folks, as you might expect for a small boat. Uh, but each of the three, uh, at least Increman and Cirrusol, had one Great Lakes pilot on board, including two of them that would be on Leclerc's ship, the Sebastopol. Uh, make note that they also had a radio operator and a functional radio. So they would depart on noon of the 23rd, uh, 1918. Uh, the Great Lakes would close down for navigation that year on the 30th. So you can see how close uh, they had cut the departure and the pressure that they were under. The gear was very common for the time, chronographer, hand leads, celiac logs, barometers, nothing strange. Again, except the pressure to get them out of the Great Lakes before freeze up. So last trip, this was the fellow that was in charge of them, uh, one Adrian Jean Leclerc. Interesting fellow because again, it's a wonderful example of scraping history and finding something else in that scrape. Something else pops up that you were totally unexpected. This fellow was a graduate of the French Naval Academy. He was well experienced, uh, service uh, sea time in battleships, cruisers, including trawlers in the Bay of Biscay. So he was really the ideal man to be in charge of delivering these ships. And uh, by 1917, he was uh, in the North American uh, Naval Mission that uh, France had sent over, and he would be a captain in 1935. But he also ended up other places, uh, and one of them was Dunkirk. Uh, during the May 27th evacuation of Dunkirk, of course, the beginning of World War uh, II in, in many respects. But he would be the French admiral at the time, the rear admiral, in charge of getting French soldiers and sailors out of Dunkirk. So he would be the Frenchman on the beach with the radio trying to get his forces onto the British ships so they could be retrograded to safety in England. And he would be successful in removing many thousands of his men uh, but unable, of course, to get everybody off the beach. He would end up again in Operation Torch in North Africa. Uh, Operation Torch was uh, 1942. It was the invasion of North Africa by the United States forces with uh, some Brits and some uh, Canadians involved too. And the, the Vichy French, uh, which were in effect the legitimate government of France, was defending their possessions in North Africa. They did not want the American forces coming in to seize them. They were, after all, a free nation on their own. However, there was a lot of skullduggery and uh, back and forth espionage being carried out between the two sides. Uh, the United States was trying to convince the French, just lay down your arms when we hit the beach because we're coming to rescue you, we're your savior. Uh, the French took some exception to that and the fella in the middle of it again, that's the, the Eastern Task Force at Algiers was our friend Leclerc, who was commanding French naval forces there and did in fact uh, order his uh, aircraft that he had to attack uh, the United States forces, although that order was never carried out due to heavy fog on the airfield. But again, he, he pops up in this little nexus of history. So here's the plan. The three French vessels, Anchorman, Cirrusols, with Sebastopol and Leclerc will depart the, uh, Fort William intention down through the locks all the way down through the Great Lakes, stage off at Montreal and then continue on through to Boston. Nothing special there. 
except uh, midnight on the 26th, three days after they've left the Sebastopol alone will reach uh, the Canadian Sioux. Uh, she will wait a little bit, but the other two ships do not show up. Uh, the last time she had seen them was off of the Keweenaw Point. So she will continue to lock through onto Kingston uh, and there she will find out that the other two had not never arrived at the Sioux and were in fact considered to be missing. Now her continuing on was normal, that was SOP, that's what she was supposed to have done, uh, not waited for everybody, but just continued on yourself. But again, with the missing ships, the clerk would quickly be turned around and headed back to try and find uh, his missing charges. So the first search should be done, and one of the great myths of the entire episode was that, well, this was wartime, and even though the war effectively ended on 11 November, the 11th day of the 11th hour of the 11th month, um, they were still under naval orders, secrecy, sealed orders, couldn't open them up, nobody could talk about it because somehow the Germans might find out. Uh, that, of course, was so much nonsense and really could have come out of social media today. Uh, the reality is, as soon as the French determined that the ships were missing uh, and unaccounted for, a, a very large search effort was done. Uh, the folks uh, at the Builders Yard and Thunder Bay were able to get Fort William, were able to muster two tugboats for the Great Lakes uh, Towing Company, and the, uh, the Bennett and the Sarnia would search all of the North Shore and down the coast as far as uh, Otter Island or Otterhead. They would search Isle Royal. They would also swing around, search the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula, and the American uh, Coast Guard would do a swing search past the Whitefish Point area. As well, as they were contacting all of the freighters that were on the Great Lakes at the time, had they seen anything, any of the activity that was waterborne was checked to see, did they find anything, did they see any evidence, did they come across anything that will help us find these ships? And the answer always came back, no. But there were lots of rumors and misinformation. Oh, I had seen them on Caribou Island. Uh, they're both fine. And of course, reality is it turns out to be just some sort of a sick joke. U.S. Coast Guard ground search teams would search the Keweenaw Peninsula. The lifeboat stations in Marquette, as well as Munising, uh, and on down uh, through the shipwreck coast, would walk the beach to looking for evidence and would find nothing. By this point, the clerk is back. He will take personal charge of the search, and he will uh, charter a tugboat out of the Sioux, run the entire North Shore, including um, Caribou Island and Michigan Island, up as far as Otterhead, and trying to find any evidence of his missing uh, compatriots, he will find nothing. And everybody along the shore he was able to question uh, will come up blank too. And it was certainly miserable weather that he was driving in. So, all that said, there was one report that came out that was intriguing, but essentially had no evidence to back it up. And that was that at Richardson Harbor, which is right up in here, just north of Michigan Cotton, Richardson Harbor right here, during the height of the storm, and we'll talk about the storm, a lumberjack crew on shore at their camp claims to have heard the wailing whistles of vessels blowing distress signals. They were concerned enough that they raised the lantern at the entrance to the river, that, to the entrance to Richardson Harbor to help any vessel trying to come into safe shelter. Um, nothing ever came of it. The whistles eventually went away. There was no evidence that anything had ever happened, but that became a, kind of an intriguing idea that simply didn't have anything behind it. First wreckage would actually be found on the 6th of December at Grand Marais, Michigan, and that would be right about it here. And uh, the clerk at the time, of course, still searching for the wrecks, was able to take a train to Sydney, Michigan, train all the way, excuse me, train to Sydney, a dog sled up to Grand Marais, 25-mile uh, runs, below zero weather, uh, absolutely miserable, and only to determine that what they had found was really lumber that was not from any of his ships, and the life ring was not from any of his ships either. But two days later, they would find what was clearly the, the old boat from the Sarasols 
on the beach, and that was found by the crew from the Two Heart Coast Guard station. Leclerc, sitting in Grand Marais, probably should have gone and looked at that himself, but he did. He didn't have the guts to do another 25-mile dog sled race. He said, "I'll find out by telephone and by uh, conversation with the station keeper." It was clearly his boat, uh, so he just was able at that point to return to Thunder Bay. By the 15th of December, they'd given up hope and notification of next of kin letters went out. So what happened? Well, what we know is this. What we know is that they, they came out of Thunder Bay, they made the turn, and originally their course would have taken them right down the middle of Lake Superior and into the Sioux. Uh, that was one selected by Leclerc. He didn't want to spend his time up on the North Shore, mostly because all of the beacons had been pulled by Canadian uh, Lighthouse Service, so there was really no lights to help guide him. He didn't want to take the time to do the South Shore, which would have been a safer route with all of the harbors he could have ducked into. He chose to go straight down the middle. His pilots didn't particularly like that, but he didn't pay any attention to his pilots. So they're out about here. They're about 35 miles out of Copper Harbor. When the wind will suddenly turn southwest and you get a pretty good southwest gale kicking up, uh, these boats do not sail well on a heavy beam sea. So at that point, the clerk will turn almost due south to quarter into them and find the shore in the vicinity of Copper Harbor. So he's off Copper Harbor Light. He's now well sheltered by the tip of by the bulk of the key and off from the worst of the weather. And he will proceed with his other boats following up through and head into the passage at Manitou Island. And it is here at about one in the morning that the lights of the two boats behind him, running somewhere between the quarter mile and 600 yards back, uh, will disappear. He doesn't think anything of it particularly because he's dealing with his own problems, his servo motor, uh, which was in effect the motor that controls the power steering for the boat, if you will, had failed. So he was being driven in a big 360 degree loop that it, it took him quite a bit of time to finally get everything squared away again and get the boat moving. So at that point, while he was distracted, these two lights disappeared. Now, whether that means they sunk or whether that means they were just covered up with the snowstorms that were periodically blowing through uh, is, is very questionable. Uh, no, they just simply were no longer within his visibility. He will continue on and he will at that point, because the problems with the servo motor decide the best thing for him to do is to come in to anchor, shelter at Bay Degree, which he will do, and work on repairing his motor. Uh, he will assume that the boats will either follow him in, which they did not, or they would continue on the trip, which they apparently, to his thinking, did, and continue on down now. So, what happened? Well, the obvious idea is that they had a collision. If you've got two boats missing at the same time with crews, that makes perfect sense. The problem being that the Great Lakes pilots traditionally don't like to be near another boat anyway. They like to be well distant. So that tends to be then unlikely. Well, maybe the hulls opened up. Well, they were all riveted construction hulls, well inspected. That probably didn't happen. Uh, could they have broached into wind and sea? Sure. Uh, the ballast could have shifted. They were carrying a lot of coal as ballast. Uh, that coal is not necessarily a good material for ballast, but we'll talk about why they ended up using it. Could have been equipment failure, rudder, or engine. At this point, unknown. Meanwhile, the French ambassador in Washington decides that we need to have a more thorough investigation of what happened. We simply can't have two French naval vessels with all hands disappear on an inland lake. Where are they? So he will send his assistant, another lieutenant, uh, along with his chief engineer, to perform the investigation. They will attempt to get support from the Canadian government, but they will be unable to do so because the single individual who was appointed as the rec master for Canada uh, is now in Alaska, contributing his expertise to investigating the loss of the Princess Sophia, a big passenger steamer with 364 folks lost. And he has no assistant, he has no additional assets he can give to the French Navy. 
Well, the folks at the uh, the shipyard at Canadian Car and Foundry believe the only explanation is collision. They can't think of what else could have happened because it would obviously impinge on the quality of their construction. Uh, they believe it happened too quickly for even a wireless message to be sent or a flare to be uh, ignited. Uh, they blame the crews as being, quote, inferior quality um, and didn't like the way they were maneuvering their vessels when they were launched at, uh, at Thunder Bay and how they did the sea trials on them. Meanwhile, our lieutenant will run down and uh, speak with the pilots who are on board Sebastopol, the surviving vessel. And they will say good conditions till about seven. That's when the gale came up, uh, some leakage on the vessel headed for land and off Copper Harbor, fall into the trough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera a lot of trouble, but otherwise really no particular problems. So they gave a pretty bland explanation of what occurred. They were able to provide a very tight timeline of when the lights disappeared, when the vessel came to anchor, the surviving vessel at Bay Degree, and that uh, Leclerc at that point had looked around, not seeing them, and asked, uh, you know, where they were. And uh, one of the pilots has later claimed to have told him they are gone. Now, whether that's a something that was uh, truthful or something that was made up later for the dramatic effect uh, is a bit confusing. Certainly there were some defective rivets uh, that was well known, but that was not considered to be significant. Um, stability to the pilots was okay. Uh, but again, they got into the same issue that the clerk as the, as the flotilla commander, if you will, uh, did not speak with his pilots. And they, uh, they weren't real happy about not being considered for their advice. Um, lights will disappear. Helm will fail, they had continual problems with the helm, but were able to rectify it each time. So they come to anchor in Bay Degree, uh, and again, they will, uh, they will wait there a little bit before they continue on. The advantage to having run the South Shore is that you would have had protection as soon as you got to Big Bay, Marquette, Munising area, even through the Grand Marais. So you had a better route to run than going down Mid Lake, but again, that was a decision that was made by Leclerc. Now, we talked about stability, and here's the problem that the French were having. Boats one through nine were properly stabilized. In other words, they carried the ballast they need to have in the right places. The, the French Technical Service determined where it needed to be. They ran the various stability tests that were necessary to validate their recommendation. Because what they were using as principal ballast was the artillery shells for the two five-inch naval guns that were on board the ship, or four-inch, uh, five-inch guns, four-inch guns. So the shells themselves, which were very heavy and could be packed tightly so they would not shift in a seaway, they would not easily contribute to the vessel capsizing, uh, were being used. But when they got to the last three, the French had real concerns whether or not they would get the ships done in time. And they didn't want to have to leave all of this ammunition piled up on the docks in uh, Fort William. They wanted to make sure that was gone and out of Canada. So they loaded it on previous ship runs. So in other words, ships one through nine carried the ammunition for ships uh, 10, 11, and 12, which means when you get ready to sail 10, 11, and 12, you had to find other ballast. And what they chose to do was to use coal. And again, coal as a ballast is always very questionable. Um, but, um, and the clerk was never happy as the commander uh, with what they had done. He didn't feel the ballast as, as determined by coal was the best way to go. I talked about the naval guns, two of them on it fore and aft, uh, each one a four inch, each one contributing about five tons of additional weight, and that did not include the mounting mechanism that you can see beneath that, uh, that deck area. So certainly while they were not considered to be a problem by the French uh, technical service, they uh, obviously did contribute to stability issues on the ships. 
So the clerk finally sits down with Lieutenant. What does he think happened? They, I, they ran aground at, at Manitou Island, except there was no evidence of that in any way. Uh, they capsized Hellmare, broaching perhaps in the in the, the, the beam sea from the southwest. Uh, engine failure, perhaps the engines flooded, and they had debris in the engine rooms because they hadn't cleaned them up properly. So small pieces of wood, small pieces of material were washing around on, on, on quite literally the, the in the bilge of the boat, and uh, easily could have got in some of the moving gear air of the the engines, uh, perhaps fouling them and preventing them from running. Could have been a collision as one vessel tried to rescue the crew from the other one, except they had been specifically ordered not to conduct the rescue. And if the other ship was in question, that was something we just had to deal with, but you were not to bring the vessels together to allow that to happen. Uh, Leclerc, uh, again, never liked his pilots. Uh, timid suggestion to my pilots, more worried about their fate. Extreme prudence, too careful, all of which makes sense to me. Uh, and that uh, he was never worried about his own ship. He had mastered her movements and didn't need the pilots. None of those pilots spoke French. Uh, none of the French spoke English other than the clerk, and that was very little and very badly. Uh, they did have translator problems. Uh, the clerk would complain that they were not real navigators, but experienced persons accustomed to sailing uh, within sight of land. Uh, my last bullet difficulty getting pilots it truly was because this was the middle of the great flu epidemic of 1918. So it was hard to find people willing to willing to continue to work. Uh, so Attaché came up with the conclusion that the servo motors uh, shafts seized, uh, that this was a real problem based on their shakedown cruises in, at Fort William, uh, that the, the rivets themselves were loose and even when recalked, uh, very quickly opened again. Uh, he didn't like the way the steel frames were being joined or aligned below French standards as he looked at them. Uh, but again, this was civil construction. This was not warship construction. So was that a real problem or just an imagined problem? Um, didn't like the workforce at uh, the Canadian Car and Foundry. Um, so you go back, was this too much carping or just, or was it, uh, was it legitimate issues? Well, here's uh, several of the ships that have been launched, obviously. They're waiting for fit out. And you can see the construction, the riveted the steel construction on them and the basic layout of the vessel. Uh, the arguments that they were not strongly built, again, is another one of the great myths. Uh, before those ships were launched, they were approved by the Lloyds inspector on site. They were improved, approved rather by the French naval inspection teams and certainly by the shipyard themselves. So they certainly were staunch and well-built vessels. One of them, in fact, the Botson, later as the SS Perry, was used by Admiral Byrd in one of his Arctic expeditions. Um, two of them were used by the Royal Canadian Navy during World War II as anti-submarine vessels. Uh, here's an example of Perry again. You can see how much uh, gear she's carrying on her deck and the windage that presented, but it was no problem for her in her Arctic work. And uh, the Lloyds inspector on site, the French minesweepers built at the Canadian Car and Foundry Company shipyards were structurally strong and seaworthy and as perfect a type of a boat as I, as, as, as I have ever inspected. Uh, so certainly a, a seal of approval from there. Poorly trained crews, uh, there was a myth that the crews were all actually ex-soldiers that were too ill and sick to work in the trenches anymore, so they were transferred to the Navy. And um, yeah. this one I finally tracked down as a myth after you read in the, in the newspaper that a couple of them were out with some local gals in Fort William and bragging about their medals that they got in the trenches. And you said, okay, there's some validity to that, except you dig a little deeper when you go through the some of the death certificates and find out that about eight per boat were Marin's Fusiliers. And then you drag into that a little bit, and you find out that that's roughly equivalent, roughly equivalent to the United States Marine Corps. In other words, seagoing soldiers who perform military duties on vessels. Particularly, they formed the gun crews of the, the two minesweepers. So were they soldiers? Yes. Were they in the trenches? Probably, from the standpoint at the beginning of World War I, virtually all of the mariners 
uh, Fusiliers were formed into a large brigade of about 800, 800 about 8,000 men and fought in the trenches for a period of time before they were rotated out and back to the ships. So you'd certainly had a smattering of men that were in the trenches and probably had a medal for so being. Uh, wireless operators and experience, no, not true. Uh, powerful Southwest gale, not really when you check the weather. Wartime secrecy, obviously not. Secretly scuttled, um, eh, maybe. And torpedoed by a U-boat, that's my favorite. That's probably what happened as it crossed under the Mackinac Bridge. Um, improperly ballast with coal, the final three, perhaps uh, certainly leadership failures were involved. They weren't using the pilots uh, the, the, who could have advised better, perhaps on route, weather, local knowledge, the whole interface between French and English, uh, broached, capsized, perhaps. But regardless, they sank suddenly. An absolute lack of bodies, uh, no, no evidence found the following spring, uh, no remains ever recovered, all suggest certainly cataclysmic capsizing. And intriguingly, no reports of lifeboats, or rather life belts. So where are they? Obviously, each sailor would have had a life jacket of some kind, a life belt of some kind, but never were any discovered. So you can presume that they are it's probably still in their cases and in, in the uh, cabin of the vessel and that maybe is where the crew is too sheltering from the, the uh, heavy weather they were in myth short-lived ships all fell apart after they were built uh well of the 10 remaining five would be scrapped two founded at sea three were driven ashore and wrecked average age of the vessels when they were taken out of service either by by you know, storm or deliberate uh, scrapping 33 years Certainly a good, useful life for a trawler. Example of what, uh, again, one of these vessels would have looked like. You can pearl around on these a little bit and you can determine here's some of the sweep gear, particularly the wing walls that would have kept the, uh, the sweep line up and open. Looking over here, you can see some more of the, the uh, trawling gear. This particular yawl boat is uh, Sebastopol, but she would have been identical to the one found on the beach by the Coast Guard in uh, 8 uh, December. But wait, this is what happens. You keep scraping and scraping and scraping, and these things came up. In 1934, a fisherman on Mishpacotten Island uh, discovered what they believed to be the remains of two French naval uh, sailors. Uh, believe they were naval uniforms. They found what they thought were ID tags. Uh, they sent the ID tags to the authorities and then to make sure that they didn't become, the remains didn't become some kind of ghoulish tourist attraction. They took them, put them in a fish box and buried them in a secret location on the beach. So is that real? The hoax are unconnected. I'm convinced it really happened. I'm not convinced they're necessarily French sailors. Uh, it's pretty tough to, to make that determination, but it does fit in, especially if you look at this type of a theory that old Sherlock told us, if you've eliminated all possibilities, whatever remains must be the truth. And uh, we stated mow the grass, but where are they really? 10 cents? Everybody's been looking right here off the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula. That was the last sighting of them, the last place people know definitely they were. And that grass has been mowed and mowed and mowed and mowed again. Again, you're working with very small targets at 145 feet, and you're working in very deep water with some very interesting terrain features, but they have been, I think, well searched for there. If you listen to Leclerc and his idea that they were 30 miles out uh, and sunk there, that would put them about right where the second arrow is. You can't ignore the idea of Richardson's Harbor with the blowing of the, of the distress whistles that the lumberjacks supposedly heard, especially when you key that together with the bodies found on Mission Island in 1934, because that's the closest those two might well be connected. The most intriguing it actually connects it to the Edmund Fitzgerald. When they went out and did the initial sonar work on the Fitzgerald following the loss, 
the contract was given to a private operator and they used the USS Coast Guard cutter Woodrush with Captain um, Jimmy in command, Hobal. And as they were lining up the fish and lining up to make a couple of runs, they picked up targets, two small targets that were offset from the Fitzgerald by several miles and never identified and never looked at because they weren't part of the contract. So you knew they were there, but you weren't looking at them. You were more worried about finding out what you could about Fitzgerald than you would these small targets. So when you, you kind of pull away, okay, what could they be? Um, you've got to come up with the idea they could be, or one could be anyway, one of the minesweepers, because when that Southwest Gale was running here at Grand Ray, a patrolling Coast Guardsman reported to have seen two strange vessels coming coming close to shore, and he warned them off with a costume, and they turned back out to the lake and continued heading east. So could that have been increment and Cirrusols still trying to find their way to the Sioux, finding the shore, seeing the Coast Guardsmen and realizing they were off course a little bit of continuing on, only to be overwhelmed by weather here in the area near the Fitzgerald. Uh, it's an interesting theory. It, beyond that, it's only a theory. So here's the problem. You've still got two, two, you do have two French warships, sovereign nation, national ships, 38 French sailors on each one of them, two Canadian citizens. Obviously, you'd have to consider this to be a war grave. That opens up now all of the issues of photography, of archaeology, of verification. What happens when you find it? How do you police it? How does the French government suddenly become involved? How do you back off? What's the roles to play by all of the various legal entities? I think you've got more problems finding them than you would if you didn't find them. Well, that's my story. Uh, I hope you found that interesting. I hope you found that it's more involved than you think it is. And again, you have only received a, a very um, high altitude view of the situation in the story. Each one of these slides that I, I threw up here, you could spend an hour or two trying to discuss and parse a, a, a part. Uh, but it's to me, it's really the most baffling shipwrecks day in the Great Lakes. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to uh, to try and answer. But I do have to warn you uh, that yes, there's a book coming uh, in manuscript form, and I'm still in the process of doing final edit on it. So there will be more. And if I can get out of here and you can take command, we're good. Okay. Let me get my uh, screen loaded back up again. And we will uh, give you all some time to ask questions using that chat feature you see in the upper right. Uh, meanwhile, uh, just to summarize real quickly, the Visitor Center in Duluth, Minnesota is open Thursday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. They are doing vessel arrival uh, uh, and departure announcements. There's a cell phone tour available outdoors. And um, at the Sioux Locks, we have closed the visitor center for the season, but the park and observation platform remain open from 9 to 6 p.m. Uh, the platform will close when the snow and ice conditions make it too dangerous to allow people in it. Uh, it has snowed here, but we are not yet at that dangerous point yet. And the visitor center in Duluth will remain open uh, while um, they are able to comply with uh, state and federal health uh, requirements. And with that, I will look and see what we have for questions. I do have an interesting comment from uh, Robert Manning concerning uh, uh, wooden hulls on minesweepers. This was 1918. They were not yet in the magnetic anomalies or magnetic mines. So they would build the hulls of these out of steel. It only was later during World War II that you got very concerned with the, the magnetic binding of, or rather the use of magnetic mines and then move to wooden hull mine sweepers, or in today's case, uh, fiberglass. 
And uh, we had a question from Karen. She's asking, is scanning near the Fitzgerald allowed or is that area still considered off limits? To my knowledge, the area is still considered to be off limits officially by the Canadian government. Um, I don't think anybody would be in trouble as, as far out, as far away from the wreck as these targets were found. In other words, they're not up to Fitzgerald, they're not with Fitzgerald, they are uh, miles away. Okay. And uh, Mark is asking, is the position of the targets found by the Woodrush public information? Also, did the fishermen describe where on Bishop Cotton Island the bodies were found? Uh, the answer to the second part is yes. Um, I don't recall the top of my head uh, the location on the island, Great Sand Bay, I think, on Little Sister Island, uh, which is one of the offshore islands of Mishapakot. It's easier to say Mishapakot and people know where that is as opposed to trying to find an island off it. Uh, the other part of it is no, it's not public knowledge or it's not publicly available, not for, through any nefarious scheme, but at the time they were doing it, nobody cared. And it wasn't part of any of the official uh, survey work, so it never appeared in any official documentation. And speaking uh, with the sonar operator, he doesn't even remember beyond pretty much what I just said, uh, what they had. Uh, it was kind of like over there somewhere. Okay. And uh, this uh, probably relates to Ralph's question. Were any surveys done where the Woodrush found the two targets? Uh, no, to my knowledge, nothing has been back there looking. Because I imagine no, it's kind of like when well, you're no, we're looking for your keys in the house and you find something else that you lost, but it's not what you were looking for. So you just keep going looking for your keys. You just keep looking. It, it wasn't what I wanted. I'm not worried about it. And it's it just falls off in my memory. Uh, I don't think you would. I know that you could not put an X on the map. You couldn't even put a big X on it because it's, it literally the, the circular error probable would be massive. Uh, it's, it's just in the lake. But that kind of adds to the mystery. Correct. It's been virtually impossible to find plans to any of the ships, uh, which is frustrating. The um, Mar Manitowoc Maritime Museum is the official repository of all of the documentation from Maritime from Mark from uh, Maritime Shipbuilding Company, but their collection doesn't really begin until World War II. Mm -hmm. well, to get anything earlier than that, I'm assuming it just got bundled off into the great big dumpster and went off to the landfill. Uh, very frustrating. Uh, I've been able to backdoor into, into some of the documentation, but it is certainly not what you would hope to be able to have. Well, you know, it kind of reminds me of the program we had in September, uh, where, you know, it just once again reminds us that real life is not like the movies that you see, where after, you know, a couple hours in, you get a nice tidy solution and an answer. There are a lot of unsolved mysteries out there. I've been chasing this one for 40 years maybe longer and it's um, it's finally coming to an end the problem is okay i have a book uh, i have a manuscript and my manuscript obviously doesn't end like it should which would be they found them today and here's all the story of finding and great pictures and all that there's always found them well yet it's a great story so how do you publish the book without the ending <laughs> and make it viable uh, Unfortunately, sometimes that's just what real life works like. Oh, I, yeah, but everybody wants, like you said, <laughs> a nice, nice tight solution in a red bowl and, you know, being done in, I don't know, a, a five-hour read or something. Uh, so we have to think about that. <laughs> well, and uh, while we're waiting to make sure we don't have any more uh, questions, I'm going to post a link to our survey. If uh, everyone would please take a, a minute or two to just fill that out real quickly. It helps us justify uh, continuing to do these programs and helps us plan future ones. And 
I am going to also post a link to our YouTube page where you can find this program and all of the ones we have done before about a variety of really interesting topics. And um, I think that's, uh, that's about all of our questions. I'll move on to, um, once again, if you can join us next month, uh, December 2nd, uh, we'll be having a program about passenger cruising on the Great Lakes, uh, which was quite an industry um, early in the 20th century. Oh, we have a comment that uh, uh, Reed is saying, thanks, Fred. I look forward to your next book. I'm partial to the Haunted Lakes books. Do you have an estimate as to when it will be available? I My guess would be we're aiming for springtime um, of this coming year. So uh, that's my best guess. I just write them. I mean, uh, the publishers <laughs> deal with it from there. But if anybody okay. has any theories, if anybody has any great ideas, um, if anybody speaks French, naval, no, if anybody speaks naval French of 1918, I really would love to talk with you. Okay. Um, and, and if you have a billion dollars and want to scan the bottom of Lake Superior with your private yacht, I'm sure you're interested in meeting that person too. Well, you know, when, when Cousteau was still kicking and he came up to Lake Superior a very long time ago, I tried to convince him to use Calypso, which was a former French minesweeper, to find the other two. And what a great story that would be. And he didn't want to touch it. So I gave him I my... I guess that whole international thing makes it messy. It's going to be incredibly messy. Uh, I mean, realize when LaBelle was found, which was, uh, oh, what's his name, on uh, LaSalle's boat, uh, when he was looking for the Mississippi, the mouth of the Mississippi, and getting ready to colonize it, they lost, he had five or six boats, he'd lost all of them except one. We lost that one too, LaBelle, and the mutiny that the mutineers would end up killing LaSalle. But that was discovered archaeologically maybe 15, 20 years ago. And I think it was University of Texas or Texas TCU, rather, uh, did the archaeological workup on it and it came up with thousands and thousands and thousands of artifacts. And right at the end, the French government came in and said, thank you for finding our boat. And <laughs> we'll thank take you it for now. Serving all of our architect, all of our artifacts, because <laughs> it was still a French naval vessel mm -hmm. where everybody had assumed that the king had given it to La Salle. Uh, the French were able to come up with the documents that in effect said, we will loan you this boat. Uh, so now you got into an internet, quite literally an international incident that was finally solved at the Department of State level, uh, who had it, and who could use it, and the deal they finally cut was that uh, the University of Texas or TCU uh, would be the, uh, had the rights for 100 years, I think, or 50 years, some period of time to display the artifacts, but they would be owned by France, and they, thereafter they would be returned to France. So, I mean, the deal was made. And I'm not faulting the French. It is indeed their vessel and their history and their traditions. And the same thing would certainly be very, very clear here, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Ralph is asking, are you able to obtain a copy of the Woodrush's logbook for the day in question? Um, I sure I can. I didn't because in conversation with the sonar operator, uh, he indicated that no record had been made of it. And when, wasn't I spoke, of interest, I guess. Uh, when I spoke with Captain Hobart, it was that was the same answer too, that we just didn't care. No, was any record made, none was. So it's just passing in the night. It's kind of like when you've got your own boat, uh, boat out and you're looking and you've got the bottom scanners on and you do all this. Anytime you hit something interesting, you always hit the dummy button to record where you are, because you just mm -hmm. may want to. But that was technology from 1975. True. That is uh, obviously archaic by our standards. Ralph is commenting that a, a logbook should show the courses that they traveled. And I would think that that's probably the case, but they 
traveled so much that without pinging a target, I mean, that's, that's still a huge area to scan. Um, yes, and I was trying to get even just the, the general course direction of what they were doing. And uh, it was just too much of it uh, because of the number of angles they were shooting and the number of layups they were doing. It wasn't just back and forth, east, west, east, west. Uh, they were doing literally a circular pattern, if you will, at every possible compass point they could and obtain the best imagery they possibly could. So you'd have this mass of information that really was not decipherable. But, you know, I'll track it down too. <laughs> You're scratching all the time. Well, thank you, Fred, for doing this for us. Well, thank you for having me. It's always fun to talk maritime history. It's always fun to talk with people that really want to know something that are the, the cutting edge of, of knowledge. And that's indeed what you, you have on your program. It's the people that well, come. Uh, those are the, the people that really want to know. And they're, I, I, again, I just always enjoy opportunities to chat with them. And uh, Karen, Karen has uh, commented, I'm just getting started in scanning, looking for a lost Navy bomber near St. Joseph, Michigan. It's a lot of time staring at screens and trying to drive the boat straight. Major props to those who have done it for a while. And uh, I've, I've spent some time on, on craft scanning and it is tedious and monotonous and boring and hours and hours of trying to hold your course heading and watching a monitor. Well, that's why, A, God made autopilots. <laughs> the other thing is it's so much better to sit back on, on, while scanning with a cup of coffee and maybe you've got a little um, hot fryer going in the boat so you've got some you know, fresh food to eat, some nice, <laughs> nice chicken, uh, you've got a can of beer, you've got the air conditioners turned on. I mean, it's not all bad. If you can uh, get a nice yacht for that, <laughs> sign me up. Like. Yeah. I remember the old days. I remember sitting there in an open boat with trying to read a screen that was smoking because you were burning the paper. And you were lucky if you had a dark image of something and you say, hey, great, you know, let's go dive it. Oh, you know, darn, it's 300 feet of water. Fuck it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it takes a little more planning. It's almost like, you know, being there with an ROV. That's why God made them too, so you don't have to get wet. <laughs> exactly. You can Spend time on a decompression line. Um, yes. However, that's a whole different story too. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, uh, thank you everyone. You can see our various contact information um, and our YouTube channel there on the screen. And we invite you to come back December 2nd. We'll have uh, more posts to announce it on BoatNerd.com, uh, their news page, and also on our social media sites for the Sulox Visitor Center Association, the Detroit District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the Lake Superior Marine Museum Association pages. And that's December 2nd, 1230 uh, Eastern Time, 1130 Central Time. And Ranger Jeanette will be talking about the kind of the golden age of passenger uh, cruising on the Great Lakes. And she'll be talking a little too about that industry today. And thank you again.